with the last half video for in my gymnastics team. Um, and of course, you know, I grew up uh, before I sort of migrated to the UK, I grew up all and I, I, I lived all my life in Parnagara, in a very important part of the district. So I'm very pleased to uh, uh, be here. Um, and uh, before we sort of, sort of get into the discussions, and I think Richard has to sort of set the scene in terms of identifying the broader view of uh, disasters and, and hazard profiles. So you might wonder, I suppose, you know, we both are sort of coming from the engineering, the engineering background, and what on earth that these two are doing among, among uh, uh, hundreds of doctors. So that is, I think, that it tells sort of shows how, how we need to be working together in solving these kind of problems. So particularly before the COVID uh, 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 pandemic began, we, we dealt with uh, uh, health issues, but not that much, I must say. But with this, of course, we, we, we have to be agile, and we started that in working with the health sector and try to incorporate health uh, uh, hazard management within the natural uh, hazard management. So in that perspective, uh, since the COVID pandemic began, we have actually done uh, quite a number of publications and you can sort of see high, high impact journal papers and also sort of a lot of uh, policy documents, uh, also including the development and uh, partners such as the Ministry of uh, Health. Um, and also, sort of not only that, we have to sort of work with the uh, United Nations in, in preparing uh, a guideline on how. Uh, the local authorities can uh, prepare better, uh, particularly uh, uh, at the front line of uh, front line of pandemics uh, and, and so on and so forth. So this is actually the background where we are coming from. So we just actually sort of discussed about the uh, the cascading impact and the systematic risks. We we shouldn't be thinking about disasters in isolation. This is actually very much linked together. So in that sense, I think. Thinking this whole thing as, as, as a package is, is extremely uh, is important. So, in that sense, I think it is fair to sort of say that the disasters don't stop coronavirus. Uh, I, I think that is actually a fair, uh, uh, fair statement to uh, uh, make. So, you can actually sort of see how uh, the, the coronavirus and, and floods have actually occurred uh, at the same time. And this is actually a picture from from the UK, uh, dealing with uh, dual challenges, for example, flood risk management in the UK during the pandemic. So you can actually sort of see, of course, you know, these uh, hazards profiles, they don't have any, any boundaries as such. And also, sort of particularly dealing with the COVID-19, separate guidelines were issued to everybody, including the health sector, about how the evacuation needs to be managed uh, uh, in, a, in a situation of a, of a tsunami. So you can actually sort of see uh, these guidelines uh, uh, that, that were published. And then, of course, uh, again, it is said officially by the IFRC, during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, more than 139 people were hit by climate crisis. So you can actually sort of see how these things are actually coming, coming uh, together. And of course, the wildlife in, in California and Hurricane uh, Ida in, the, uh, in, in Luciana and so on and so forth. So they, they have to sort of arrive at the same time as, as, as the COVID. So in that sense, I think what I want to emphasize is the need to be prepared ahead of time for a natural hazard. And that actually means to include the way to protect communities. In that sense, the role of health uh, sector is actually uh, it takes the priority. And also, sort of, uh, again, Richard highlighted this point about the urbanization and the risk. And then this is a very specific example uh, from Brazil. Combined effects of hydrometeorological hazards and urbanization on, on uh, daily risk. So again, I'm sure this type of uh, data is available in, in Sri Lanka as well. And it says that the risk of daily increased between uh, uh, up to three months after extremely wet conditions. And also it says, that daily risk following extreme drought was higher in areas that had a higher frequency of water supply shortages. I'm pretty certain that you have similar sort of data for, for the Sri Lankan context uh, as well. So what all these simultaneous disasters are actually missing with our brain, I think that is actually a fair statement to say. But having said that, these compound, compound risk scenarios are not theoretical. We are not actually here talking about theoretical basis, but one which has played out in real life. So that is what 
I, I showed some examples and also sort of Richard covered some examples um, as well. But not only sort of natural hazard, we have to actually be very mindful about the number of countries that continue to be affected by conflict or instability, uh, instability which is actually a significant. Sadly, uh, the, the economic crisis of and so on and so forth is very valid to Sri Lanka as well. However, because of this situation, dealing with multiple challenges is not easy. And it actually needs uh, a lot of steps to be taken to prepare ourselves to, to face this unknown. I, I think that is actually the bottom line of, of these discussions in linking uh, what are the disaster risks and what are the risk drivers and the systematic risks and then what is the situation of, of, of all this preparedness planning. So in that sense, I think it is actually fair to say that there has never been a better time to ensure that health features in every nation's plans to reduce the impact of disasters. I think this is actually what I really want to emphasize. And that is why we are here coming from a, a different professional group that we really need to be working together in, in solving this common problem of, of uh, preparing ourselves for disaster. We shouldn't be thinking uh, in, in compartments. The health sector uh, uh, separately and the disaster management separately, the construction industry separately. No, it doesn't work like that. We really need to be uh, working uh, together. So in that sense, Preparedness of hospitals, its staff, and the effective management of its patients is extremely important. So, in order to do that, uh, the developing the capacity of health workers in understanding disasters is really important. So, in that sense, I think I want to refer back to the hazard profile that Richard showed. It is available online. I, I suggest that you all have a look at it. It identifies uh, 300, 302 different hazards out of which. 10 are categorized under biological hazards, and how many? 88, 88 subcategories, which are directly linked to, uh, to, to the health sector. So I, I uh, suggest that you go and actually have a look at it if you haven't uh, seen it already. So it is very, very important that the health sector as a whole get a, getting a very good understanding about these disasters. And also, sort of, uh, I think it is fair to say if the system is unprepared, it says that there are obvious savings to be made in terms of economic uh, uh, in, in, uh, impact. Of course, you know, the preparation actually gives up more credibility and also sort of be uh, to, to cut the uh, cut the cost, uh, uh, to say the least. Again, this is actually emphasizing the uh, the point that Richard has, has has already done. But in terms of actually creating links between health and the disaster management uh, do exist. I'm sure particularly the colleagues who come from the public health sector, uh, I think you know this better than I do, in terms of, sort of how to sort of demonstrate the, uh, these links. I think particularly for the health sector, this type of analysis is quite important in illustrating the importance of this point and to sort of get the buy-in from other stakeholders, particularly in the country. So these are some of the points that, that I want to put forward. For example, uh, uh, biological hazards is actually a major source of risk. Again, getting back to the classifications out of 302, uh, 10 major uh, major uh, uh, themes, and out of which 88 categories are linked to health. So it is actually a point of high, high, uh, high proportion. And also, the, uh, the health, the nutrition, and immunization is actually a source of Again, I'm actually talking to the wrong audience here, you all know better than I do about, about the link between health, nutrition, and the immunization uh, with the, uh, as a source of vulnerability. And also, health effects of disasters is extremely important. And in my view, it is actually a definitive outcome of disaster impact. I think it is, fair, it, it is fair to say so. And also, the health system is critical to reducing health risk of emergencies and disasters. If you don't have a good health system, of course, I, I don't need to tell you what, what will be the result of, of, of that, really. And also, sort of health and well-being are, 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 are shared outcomes, or have to be shared outcomes. And also, at the end of the day, health is, in my view, is a human right. So these are actually some of the points that you can, can actually use very strong in creating or demonstrating the very strong links between the health sector and the disaster management. And it does exist. And this is how some of the kind of basic principles that, that, that we can use in, in justifying that. 
So getting back to the policy context, again, I'm not going to go through the, the Sendai framework in detail. I'm sure particularly the, uh, the colleagues in the emergency medicine area and also the public health, you, you all are uh, uh, thorough with the Sendai framework. And if you want to sort of know more about it, you can go and read about it. And of course, we can actually have a discussion at some other point. But it is really, really important to understand the importance of health within the, within the Sendai framework, within the disorders reduction strategy. So I have highlighted the few uh, terminology here, uh, which actually very specifically identifies the role of health in uh, in, in, in the Sendai framework. Because for example, it, it, it talks about substantially reducing uh, the, uh, the disorder risk and losses in lives, life, food, and health. So that is actually a very, very important point that I want to um, emphasize. And also, sort of getting back to the uh, details of the Sendai framework, there are several references to health in, in this framework. Of course, and, and also, sort of it actually enables the health sector to achieve progress. Again, I have actually identified some of the key points here, whereas the, the, particularly the management of national and global health risk is, is one area, and also sort of, uh, the, uh, the need to strengthen the advocacy of health uh, in, in, in the multi-sectorial concept is, 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 is another area. Um, and also sort of building collaborations between public health and other sectors. This is extremely important. Uh, the, no sector can actually work in isolation. Of course, some, in some countries they do, but it actually leads to actually very poor outcomes. So the, the stakeholders need to be working together uh, 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 particularly for the for the benefit of national uh, uh, disaster management scenarios, so that is actually extremely important. So in that sense, I think developing guidelines and and providing technical capacity and and assistance uh, to health systems to disaster risk is extremely important. So in that sense, discussions and sessions like this is, is really important, where different people come together who work in in different sectors uh, to to share their uh, to share their experience. I think uh, again, getting back to the Sendai framework, the WHO actually has uh, used the Sendai framework directly in terms of coming up, coming up with their guidance under these uh, 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 headings. A risk based approach, again, Richard actually discussed that in quite a bit of detail. Comprehensive emergency management is, is very clearly highlighted, and also the all hazards approach. Again, Richard highlighted it very clearly. We, no country has any capabilities or capacities or the resources to deal with hazards in isolation. We should be thinking about, talking about, acting about, about the bigger picture. And, and that is actually where the all hazards approach comes into, uh, in, in, into see. And also, it, it has to be inclusive. It should be people and community-centered uh, approach, because at the end of the day, they are our, our one of the main stakeholders. And also, in that process, Multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration is, is very, very important. Health sector can't work in isolation, and they have to be working with the rest of the disaster management sector and vice versa. Whether we like it or not, it, it, it should happen, and that is actually should, should be the uh, way, way forward. And, and in, in doing so, we need to be thinking about the whole, whole of health system approach, and also there are ethical considerations. Again, I'm, I'm barking at the wrong tree here. You, you, you know better than me about the ethical considerations that, that we uh, consider. So as a, a very, very small case study, you know, so I actually discussed about, uh, uh, about the principles and then linking health with the rest of the disaster management sector. So in the UK, this is actually a very small case study I want to uh, demonstrate to you. We have uh, the NHS Emergency Preparedness, Resilience and Response Framework. It is quite a mouthful, but I will refer to it as, as framework when, when, I, when I continue my, my, my talk. So this is actually, again, with our COVID-related work, we actually analyzed uh, 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 this framework in quite a bit of detail, working very closely with our, uh, with our, with our partners. So this is actually sort of a strategic framework, uh, which actually contains principles for health emergency preparedness, resilience and response for NHS funded organizations in England. But having said that, these documents are available online. Nobody will stop uh, any of us sort of picking up the right details which are applicable to any society or to any country. So uh, that is why I just wanted to sort of show you some, 
um, some key components of this framework as, as an education. So what are the basics of this framework? So this, this framework is actually built around effectively responding to disruptive events and, and thereby to maintain patient care. So again, the term disruptive event uh, was highlighted by Richard and also sort of highlighted by different uh, urban risks that we all are facing these days. And also it actually talks about the procedures that need to be in place uh, uh, in evacuating the facilities and the sheltering patients public and staff. So this is actually extremely important. Particularly in a health setting, it is very, very important that you need to be thinking about the, uh, the infrastructure and the facilities, your own staff and your and, and, and the patients. And not only that, particularly in a health setting, you need to be able to continue to deliver critical services as well. So it is actually quite a complex scenario. So you need to be actually thinking about all these aspects at the same time. And not only that, you need to be recovering as quickly as possible because you do not know what will happen in the future. So it is actually a very, very complex scenario. Maybe that a lot of other stakeholders do not actually fall into this category, but health sector is actually very much actually, you need to safeguard your people, buildings, your staff and the public, and you need to actually, so there need to be uh, uh, procedures to evacuate people. And also you should be able to, at the same time, continue with your uh, with the delivery of your critical services and also you need to recover as quickly as possible so it is actually quite a complex uh, scenario so in that sense this this particular uh, uh, um, framework actually sort of uh, based on on several principles again it is not my intention to go through them in detail but just to highlight preparedness and anticipation always it is number one for me, and also sort of, I'm, I'm sure you think about you know, about that number one as well. Preparedness is actually the key in, in, in facing any, any disaster situation. Then again, the continuity, you, you should be able to continue your day-to-day your -day operations and also subsidiary. That is actually very, very important in, in taking decisions, uh, particularly sort of going back to the lowest, most appropriate level in, in making sure that the entire system actually works perfectly. And also communication. The communication is very, very important from national to regional to local to community. So that communication line needs to be very, very, uh, very clear. And also cooperation and integration. I highlighted that, that quite a few times in, in working in, in, in teams and with the multiple multi stakeholder collective. And, and also that, that the direction, for example, with the clarity of purpose and also sort of a, 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 a uh, very good awareness of, of the strategic aim and, and supporting uh, objectives. So these are actually the six key principles of the, uh, the, the NHS uh, emergency preparedness uh, framework, which is, again, uh, all this information is available online. Perhaps, you know, if you haven't seen it before, just you know, uh, compare and see what, what sort of information uh, that, that you can capture and vice versa. So that will be very, very, uh, very much looking forward to hear uh, the rest of the talks to see what sort of activity that you do in Sri Lanka that we can actually learn and, and incorporate uh, there because we are working very closely with the UK health security agency in, in, in bringing in uh, these mighty hazard disasters uh, together. So from the point of view of cycle of preparedness, uh, again, risk management, planning, training, exercising. I think, again, I'm actually barking at the wrong tree here, but this is actually the cycle that it, it works. You need to study about what the risks are, and I suppose you, you started that you, you heard uh, a, a, a kind of a snapshot from, from Richard, and based on that, you need to plan in order to sort of actually, uh, uh, how you can actually um, respond to various in incidents, and also to know whether you have actually sufficient background information and so on and so forth. And then, linking on that, you need to train people. That is actually, again, what SLMA and, and, and the local societies are doing, which is really, really important. And of course, these things cannot be one-off situations because the, the world keep on changing and we really need to be updating our knowledge as we go along. And also, the most important thing, last but not the least, is exercising. There need to be actually refresher courses uh, and, and also sort of the, uh, the, uh, the, the risk, the, uh, the, the tabletop exercises, just to make sure that the systems that you have in place are actually credible and 
people understand the communication mechanisms and, and so on and so forth. So this is actually we call it a cycle of, of preparedness. So I'm, I'm sure that you have a very similar system or a better one. So I'm looking forward to hear, hear about, about those uh, a bit, bit later. And also in that sense, I suppose, how can you ensure that effective arrangements are in place to deliver appropriate care to patients affected by, by an emergency or, or an incident? This, these are, again, one of the core points that I, I want to highlight from the UK case study. For example, again, common consequences. You can actually maybe consider about them uh, in, in, in a bit more clearly because certain disasters are quite common, particularly in Sri Lanka, the, the, the droughts, the, the landslides, and the floods. So just it, it is okay for you to consider those as kind of, uh, kind of common consequences. But it, at the same time, you should be able to be agile and should be able to stay, should be able to adapt uh, uh, to uh, uh, to these scenarios, to other range of specific scenarios as well, because we really do not know what will happen tomorrow. Because the COVID in 2020, uh, particularly my, my Richard and I and my team, when we were coming from Indonesia after a conference, I I, I think we all got COVID 2020 January, and I think I think maybe this year to say that Richard was a case zero for for, for for the UK because we did not know it was COVID, but we all uh, uh, I think end of January, end of January 2020, we all were sort of so thick, uh, uh, flew back to the UK and 10 of us, we were sort of very, very ill. So again, we never expected that to happen. So now our lives are dominated by, by that. And let's hope that nothing like that will happen in the future, but we never know. So in that sense, the scal scalability and adaptability is extremely important. And also with that, specific planning and capacity building. So in that sense, I really need to be uh, uh, commending the uh, efforts of uh, SLMA and also sort of the, uh, the local health society, because this is extremely important because you do what you do quite well in terms of the patient care and, and, and the health, but you, you need to be sort of be up to date with the, with, with the rest of the development in terms of the new passage and the risk and, and, and so on, so particularly the, uh, the multi-sector coordination aspects. So in the in, in the UK scenario, we identify incidents in 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 three categories. Uh, I I do not know what the exact uh, categorization UK like is, but this is again the case study from the UK. We identify them under three categories. The first one is a business continuity incident. Again, I do not want to, I do not need to tell you what it is. And then the critical incident. Again, critical incident is quite a local scenario. And then the major incident. Major incident is where the cabinet. The is involved, and we consider that as quite a quite a national uh, scenario. So, if we sort of consider the uh, major incidents again, there are several categories of major incidents. So, I'm sure these things are equally applicable to the Sri Lankan context as well. Again, the, it could well be rapid onset, it could well be rising tide, uh, crowd of competition. The term is, I suppose, we are predicting what is in our what, what, particularly the Sri Lankan context, you know, when there's an issue in the Bay of Bengal, you know, that can be kind of, uh, it, it has a major impact on, on, on the uh, climate setting in, in, in Sri Lanka. And also headline news, you know, sometimes information and misinformation, we, we try to actually disregard that. But having said that, we shouldn't be doing that sometimes, maybe, because headline news would be a so that is actually we need to be quite mindful about that. And then chemical, biological, radiological hazards, and also set of the hazardous materials. Cyber security incidents are classified as major incidents, and also the mass casualties. These are the categories of major incidents in, in the UK. It doesn't mean they have to be the same in the Sri Lanka, not at all, but maybe this is something to reflect whether, whether you have a CDC in, in your system as well. <laughs> kind of a national uh, action plan, level one, two is very much local. So this is actually about uh, how the action uh, levels are working. And as I said to you before, this document is available online, freely accessible. You can actually sort of do a comparison between how the uh, how the uh, system works uh, there, with here, and, and with the, with the any, any uh, learning points. And of course, uh, I'm looking forward to actually hear about what is happening in, in, in Sri Lanka, so, so we can actually take that 
that points back to the UKC security agency also, because we all, we all are in the learning mode, aren't we? And not only that, there are several other key considerations as well. What are they? For example, strategy requirements. We can't be working in isolation. We need to see, understand what the governance system of the country and the strategy requirements are. That is extremely important. And also the cooperation between local responders. It, it should be sort of based on the uh, uh, based on the information sharing, report keeping, roles and responsibilities need to be very, very clear and also accountability. To me, the responsibility comes with accountability. A lot of people actually like to take the, uh, uh, the, the responsibility, but they do not want to be accountable. No, it, it comes together hand in hand. And also in, in this process, local health risk partnerships are very, very important. So I think I'm running out of time, but I'll try to finish this two more slides. But in the UK, what are the key priorities for the next 15 years? Very simple, four steps. The first one is to identify the importance of critical health infrastructure. I'm sure you would agree with that as well. Infrastructure is actually not the physical infrastructure, it is the human infrastructure as well. So it is actually the, the, the entire package together. People, infrastructure, and, and, and places, and spaces. Everything is extremely important. And second point is, the importance of integrating this operative reduction into local and national health system. So I, I, I'll go to the next slide and then I will actually post a question for all of you. This is very, very important and it is happening uh, in, in, in the UK. Because of course, I do come from the medical profession and I, I, I come from the construction sector and, and uh, engineering background, but we are working very closely with UK Health Security Agency and with the uh, NHS. So it, it is happening, bringing this operative and the health sector together. So, Point, developing the capacity of health workers in understanding disasters to ensure they are better prepared for such events. So it is you, we all need to be realized that disasters are they land, they land over they land about uh, floods, landslides, and so and so forth. It's 302 and 88 health health related hazards. So it, 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 yeah, it is extremely important. And in doing so, supporting and training community health uh, groups in the RR process. And in that sense, I think uh, I, I, I need to commend the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the initiatives of the SLMA and the local, the Nagara Hospital, and particularly sort of uh, my doctor, and the police manager, who actually started talking about this, uh, talking and having this discussion about bringing health and disasters together. These things are extremely important. Time continues to organize, but perhaps possibly at, at some point, but if you can do it, I think we should try and do them on, on frequent basis. And so, leaving with, with this, I will actually post the, these three uh, four issues for you. The status is don't shoot the messenger. This is based on my understanding. The importance of ensuring critical health infrastructure. My answer is yes, it is happening. I think a lot of people are working very hard in, in that area. Integrating disaster risk reduction into local and national health system and vice versa. I do not know. But several years ago, I think I must say several years ago when we did talk about incorporating COVID response to the rest of the disaster management policy in the country. Okay. By the disaster management hierarchy in the country, was sure yeah, or not, it's not our yeah, 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 So I think it is it's not the case, it shouldn't be the case. So that is why I have a question. We can hear more about it. We can actually do some forums together that we can be the country and society. Developing the capacity of health workers is definitely ongoing, and I should be looking at the question mark. It is ongoing, I know that. And also supporting the training community health yeah. groups in the RR process. And you want to look at that, they tell me that local society is an actual some time ago. So these are the four questions that I want to actually uh, uh, get you to sort of start thinking about in, in terms of moving forward. And as a kind of a, 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 a good starting point, this is actually a very good uh, uh, initiative. We did the Ministry of Health Sri Lanka. 
uh, and we came up with a kind of a, a, a vision paper in bringing health and Sri Lanka disorganization and sector together. So it was actually identified in a, in a mission paper and it was categorized under, under four uh, different missions with several interventions. Again, this document is no secret, no confidential. It is available online, just go and read it. And this is actually based on actual data that we collected. And we so many focus group discussions we had in the country and in our two year, uh, two year project. So with that, I think I have actually taken additional five minutes, and I, I hope that that you know that you would mind me doing that. Just to sort of emphasize the point that hospital residency of Sydney West is extremely important, and of course I wanted to sort of uh, take you to some of the some of the principles that uh, you should doing so by using that UK case study and mm -hmm. emphasizing the point about that four so areas of uh, uh -huh. of, 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 of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.